She said, no. And I said, well, no wonder those affirmations work for you. You don't have any defenses. I mean, your, your brain has not had to set up any of this critical screening stuff, which it will normally do every time we get hurt. If you get hurt physically or psychologically, the brain is going to see to it as best it can that it doesn't happen again. If it has to make you avoid that situation, it'll do that. If it's going to make you cloud your perception of that situation and cloud reality, it'll do that. It'll do all kinds of things. If it has to repress it totally and make you forget it, it'll do that again. But you always pay a price. You got distorted reality, you got avoidances, you got stuff that you don't even know what it is and it's causing you to become anxious and depressed and have bad relationships and uh, you're not going to achieve your potential and you, you're sabotage success. We got some slides about that anyway. We'll come back to twilight learning. Um, early days of biofeedback, this is what Gay and Wilson thought about it, you know, and a lot of people still think it's sort of like this. <laughs> How are you going to relax when you got all that stuff on you, see? And that's, that's one of the things about the mind mirror versus brain mapping. You know, the mind mirror, uh, you get it on real easily and real nicely and quickly, and it doesn't traumatize people too much. When you do a brain map, you're putting a a little helmet on with 24 sensors in it and then you got to fill them with juice and so on. It takes a while and, and people are connected to a big computer and that's a little frightening. It tends to pull you into your left brain pretty easily and you have a hard time getting back out of it. This is what biofeedback looked like in my clinic in Denver. I love that place. We had an alpha chamber chair and, and um, some really nice accoutrements there and it was a very comfortable relaxing place to do twilight learning and and certain other things. But um, ah, here we are, early scripts. We got to talking about these because one of the things that tends to happen very early in life is that we have in our brains like a video recorder. And our brain is just taking in everything that we see and hear. And we're storing those tapes away. And the tapes are set to go off if, as an adult, you have the same stimulus situation present, and then the right brain knows what to do. It says, we'll roll out tape that has to do with mother smoking, or roll out the tape with mom and dad arguing and dad beating on mom, because that's what you do when you become an adult in this situation. Uh, give you an example of how awful that can work out. We had a man sent to us uh, by the court system in Denver. He was a mild-mannered accountant that had thrown his wife through the bedroom wall through the two layers of plasterboard. She missed the studs, but she was injured. She broke some bones and terribly bashed and battered, and she turned him into the police, and uh, he'd never done anything like that before. Why did he do that? Well, it turns out that that, after 10 or 11 or 12 years of marriage, she, for the first time, had impugned his lovemaking. It turned out that way back in childhood, one night, guess what? Mummy had done that to Daddy, and Daddy had slugged Mummy and broke her jaw. The only time his father had ever done it. That was the videotape. That was stored, and it was waiting for a situation just like that. And lo and behold, it occurred. Boom, out comes the right brain program, and it's carried out before the left can even do anything about it. So the danger of early scripts is that they're illogical and magical at the same time. Um, you know, illogical and magical is fine, and, and it can make you into a very delightful adult. You know, if you have kind of a creative, artistic-like adult who's illogical and magical, it's delightful to be around them for a while. But you probably wouldn't enjoy being married to one for like 20 years, you know. But on a date, fantastic, you know, lots of fun and spontaneous and everything else. Um, this one says early scripts may block uh, the achievement of happiness. I don't care what you look like, how well educated you are, uh, how much money you have. If you've got early scripts that are negative, you're going to have one heck of a time being happy in life. And they sabotage success, you know, the dissertation anxiety. I know you've, a lot of you have experienced that or know somebody that has. They go right up, fulfill all the coursework, and then just can't get that doggone dissertation done. And they may never get their PhD, and that's the only thing they have left to do. Because that would mean they're successful. And they have a script for not being successful. You don't deserve that because you're a bad boy or a bad girl. So those early scripts are very, very tough to root out sometimes. Now, 
um, before we get into the new model of the brain, um, let's talk a little bit about what we used to do with uh, twilight learning. We knew those scripts were down there, and we figured that the scripts were in the right hemisphere of the brain primarily. That was our simplistic view of the brain in those days. And so we thought, wouldn't it be great if we could somehow bypass that left brain's critical screening and do it with biofeedback? So we invented a machine called a Twilight Learner. And what the machine did was it, um, it would sample the EEG over the left hemisphere, and when it saw theta, it would turn on the tape recorder. If you went up into alpha or beta, it would turn it off. So that way you were never conscious of the material that was being broadcast in. Now, we, we did have the patients make the tape with us, so they knew about pretty much what the tape was, and sometimes they made their own tapes. And this can be extremely effective in some cases and bounce off totally in another. Now, we never did more than 10 sessions. And one of the new things we're finding out is that it may take quite a few sessions before you get some of these new scripted ideas to take hold. Although Len Oak's new uh, system may hurry that up a little bit. And so I'm very excited about what he had to say today. Um, did it work? It worked, as I said, um, with some people and not for others. And when it worked, it was quite dramatic. You could see some, some really terrific changes in individuals as a result of that. I'll give you just, just one example, because we have a few more slides to get to before we end here. I think the most dramatic case was a man who had been terribly uh, beaten by his father. He lived on a farm in Iowa. As an adult male of about 40, he had no friends. He had a very low-level job as a sort of a printer's helper. Um, he lived in a boarding house and had a little room, and he had no, as I say, no uh, hobbies at all. All of his money went into psychotherapy. He knew something was terribly wrong, and he'd spent nine years in psychoanalysis with no results. So he heard about biofeedback and twilight learning. There was an article in the Denver Post. Came to see us. And he said, can Twilight Learning do something for him? He said, well, I don't know, but let's, let's give it a shot and see what happens. So we tried to figure out a script that we could put on the tape. And one of the favorite phrases that we often used was, I am good. He said, no, 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 that, that won't do. That, that's, that won't work. Uh, he says, I'm not good at all. That, that'll never work. I said, well, what would work? He finally came up with, I am adequate. And so <laughs> I am adequate worked. And then he went and, uh, with a bunch of others, and he went home, and he composed his own script. And not only that, but he put it to music. He actually played guitar chords. And he came back, and he had this script. And it was something like, I am adequate. I deserve to have a better life, and so on and so forth. Now, why did he do that? Because we had told him that the right hemisphere processes voice intonation contours, and the left does not. So if you're trying to get something into the unconscious of the right brain, it pays to kind of couch it in nice voice intonation contours. Do you know that there's a therapy for people with aphasia who suffered strokes in the left brain and can't speak? It's called melodic intonation therapy. It's one of the best therapies. They literally teach them to sing for their supper. They, they, they can't say, I would like some beans for supper. They can say, I would like some beans for supper. And they can do that. And they learn that. And that works. And you, you sing back to them, they understand it. But if you just say, how are you feeling today? Nothing. You've got to say, how are you feeling today? And then they understand. Now, if you think of, just as an aside, if you think of famous speakers who, have, uh, who you've heard, and you wonder whether they're activating the left brains or the right brains or the whole brains of people in the audience. You, you can think of Jesse Jackson as somebody who really gets after the right brain, you know, and Barbara Jordan and folks like that. And Franklin Delano Roosevelt was great. Kennedy was great. And then you think of Henry Kissinger <laughs> as just the opposite. Well, I wonder uh, what we should do tonight, my darling, on our honeymoon night. I think uh, I would prefer if you would uh, change into that black negligee and, and uh, we can do something very exciting this evening. It is no intonation. <laughs> But he's so brilliant that I would expect that his wife probably says, Henry, say something brilliant right now. 
quickly. This is Michael Gazaniga. It, it isn't so left brain, right brain so much, except that the verbal system, which is the conscious system, is still primarily in the left hemisphere, according to him. And we've got these little modules all around there, functional modules that are nonverbal or NVs. And they're all over the place. The problem is these can be at odds with the verbal conscious system. And the other thing that's a problem is that they're all faster than the verbal system. The verbal system, as a matter of fact, just puts a rationale on everything we do. And everything we do is pretty much dictated and things we say to a large extent by the unconscious, believe it or not. And then the conscious mind says, oh yeah, we did that because of this. Yeah, I thought of that. <laughs> yeah, it was a great idea. Yeah, I just thought it up logically. I came up with this idea. Uh, we won't go into that. That's a whole thing in philosophy right now and it's being argued. Conflicts do develop and we've talked about that. Um, your left brain can vary um, uh, in, in the, what should be done with the right brain based on these scripts from a long time ago. And so sometimes we present this placid face to the world and inside we're dying because of these scripts from, from childhood. Now, when you open up Pandora's box, sometimes you get this amazing stuff that comes up, which can be very dangerous, very volatile, anger, uh, and so on. This can happen with sound light machines, it can happen with hypnosis, it can happen with the new EEG techniques. So you have to be a little bit careful about that. <laughs> but is it better than drugs? Yes, I think it is in many ways. You know, I'm taking you off muscle relaxants. You know, those in the back can't see the fellow down in the tub there all relaxed to jello. Yes, it is, but you have to be a little bit careful when you start going into theta patterns that you don't you don't kind of activate Pandora's box. Is it safer to put a tape in while you're doing some of these down programs where you go down, ramp down into theta, delta? My own personal preference is I'd like to have something positive going on when I'm going down there, at least for a while. Uh, when you put a, a positive tape on, at least something's going in that box, uh, even as some stuff may be leaking up and coming out. If you've had a very dysfunctional background and know about it, uh, make sure that you're with friends uh, when you do some of these uh, trips that take you down to a deep level. We've already talked about David Gallen, so I think we'll jump ahead. And David Cheek is a San Francisco obstetrician um, who was the fellow that found out that meaningful sounds and silence and everything that goes on in surgery can have a dramatic effect on you because it goes in again without the critical screening. To Okay, here we go. This is a compressed spectral array from a brain mapper. Um, and we're looking at uh, a very bright individual here. Um, we're looking at T3, T4, which are the temporal uh, regions. Uh, T3 is on the left side, T4 on the right. Down at the bottom is the range of frequencies from 0 to 30. And the way these compressed spectral arrays work is time goes from top down to here. And then you see the energy occurring in the different bands as you sweep through the session. And so when you first look at these, it, it's, it's kind of a mystery. But uh, particularly look between, between 10 and 20, and you don't see a whole lot of activity there because this is a relaxation thing that this person is doing at this time. This slide is a little dark, but I want you to notice particularly now in the beta region, which is up from 13 on up. Notice all the activity that's going on here. This is uh, while doing mathematics. Um, what we're finding with bright brains is they marshal enormous amounts of beta when they're working on problems like two-digit subtraction, uh, serial sevens, and so on. And this fellow is really pulling up a lot of beta. He's really bringing his brain to bear, right brain particularly, on these numbers. He's probably doing a lot of visual imagery. With this, with this task. 